and welcome to this very special evening. A very warm welcome to William Kenridge. It's Thank you. such a huge honor, pleasure and fun to have you here at the Louisiana Museum. And my name is Sune Rifpia. I occasionally work here, uh, which is why I have to present myself, uh, but that's, that's how it goes. This film that we just saw is from 1994, and we were just talking about it while you were viewing it, and it's, it's not just by you. No, no, it's, it's a, a work by three artists, myself, Deborah Bell, South African artist, the same vintage as me, and the actor in the film, Robert Hodgins, who's a South African painter who died four or five years ago, but who's a generation older. And it was made on the basis, said, let's do a film, and we gave ourselves two days, and said, well, we'll do the drawings and then see what happens. So it was an improvisation done over the two days and then edited. And then we tried to do it three times again. <laughs> and somehow they didn't ever work quite as easily and simply as this one has done. Why would you do it again? Well, not this, because of the pleasure of working together, <laughs> of, the, of the project. And because this one had come together by itself kind of almost effortlessly. Mm. And we thought, oh, this is easy. We know how to make a film. And then we discovered that there's a fantastic possibility and way of working when you don't know what you're doing. And as soon as you know what you're doing, as we did having done the first one, it became much, much... Every decision was overthought and <laughs> overdone. And um, we had to abandon the, the next film that we tried. I, when I watched this... For the first time, I thought, uh, is that a Philip Guston lamp hanging down there? Is that a Picasso drawing in the frame? Is that a Keenholz uh, man with the watch? I, th I mean, I think all of those are there. I mean, Deborah, who drew the dancing woman, the little flickering dancing woman, was very much obviously influenced by looking at Picasso's classical period. Um, the clock on the man's face came right at the end. We'd sort of had the charcoal 
coming up his arms and over <laughs> his face, and I thought, what do we do now? We stuck with Robert complaining that he couldn't breathe, that he was covered in charcoal, <laughs> and or kind of in desperation, he said, all right, all right, all right, and took a clock off the wall and stuck it on his face. But I'm sh so one does that, but I'm sure there is also a keen holtz somewhere in the back of one's head, and that schematic way of drawing uh, a light comes from amongst other places, I'm sure Philip Guston, I'm sure you're right that it's there. But it's of course also Philip Guston gets it from the lamp in Guernica, so it comes back to Picasso uh, there. But I think one of the things I was, we was, I was interested in that became part of the film is what is it to make a three-dimensional drawing, to take a real telephone, cover it with paper, and draw it as if it's a telephone, or a fountain pen, to make a drawing of a fountain pen as a three-dimensional object, to play with the, the artificiality of the, of the set, and with fake perspectives, the angle of the desk. All of these things are, in fact, not... Well, it was a real desk covered with paper, and then we discovered if we tilted the top of the desk up, it became more interesting through the camera, and if we exaggerated the perspective. So it became a sculptural drawing. And there once or twice we exhibited it as a paper sculpture, with the film showing next to it. The, I, I mean, I should do a, a more thorough introduction of you, but it, I think that the the best thing I can say is there's hardly anything you don't do. You do sculptures, you do animations, you do prints. Well, I don't have to yeah. tell you what you do, but you do all kinds of things. And then I saw in an article about you uh, from The New Yorker that you were described as somebody with the distinct profile of a Roman proconsul. And I thought that was appropriate. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> because in New York they'd be embarrassed to say with the classic profile of a Johannesburg Ashkenazi Jew, which is the, the kind of, of the, the generic shape, I would say, which is very familiar. But I, <laughs> it's but felt it's, that a proconsul is somehow better to describe someone as. <laughs> but I was just quoting it because uh, you're actually just flown in from Rome, where you have a huge project. I guess it must be the largest project you've ever done, scale-wise. Scale-wise, it's a, what Shuna is describing is a, a frieze along one of the walls at the bank of the river Tiber, which is a stretch of river half a kilometer, 550 meters long, in which we washed images, washed dirt off the wall and left images in the dirt that was left on the wall. Uh, so it was a kind of a negative graffiti across this half kilometer. And in due course, the wall will get dirty again and the images will disappear into the darkness of the wall. So it's a, a long-term ephemeral project. It's like a slow dissolve, a slow film dissolve, but instead of the film fade to black taking seven seconds, it will take seven years. But it, it'll be it, the same thing. It's like a, a perfect thing for you to do a mural that will disappear, isn't it? Well, it's, the fact that it disappeared was an accident of the technique and of the possibilities of the site. Mm -hmm. But having said that, there's always something that emerges that's more than just happenstance when it emerges. And that the technique or the material brings part of its meaning to it. So this ephemerality, the way in which memory disappears, the provisionality of understanding are all built into the all emerge from the process itself rather than starting with them as ideas and thinking how are these best illustrated? What technique would best show the impossibility of hanging on to memory? But also the, the, the idea of erasing what is already there. This is also what goes on in, in memo. I was thinking that this, this man who was writing his memo could also be the artist trying to get hold of the idea or the, the thing, and then it just is out of hand somehow. It is, I think, I mean, there is, a, there is a connection between temperament and which materials one is drawn to using. So there's something about the ease with which you can change charcoal, that with a wipe of your hand you can destroy an image and then redraw it as quickly as you can think and change it again. So for someone who is temperamentally indecisive or uncertain of themselves, charcoal is a very good material, whereas 
copper engraving in which you have to engrave each line very with a lot of effort and thought is not good for someone who wants to immediately change the line. So there is a connection between erasure and charcoal and um, what it suggests and who the person is who's using it. Which I suppose has to do with understanding the world either as fact or as process. And there's something in charcoal and its changeability and in animation as a technique of transformation um, that comes out very strongly on the side of understanding the world as process rather than fact. Also, it's, I mean, even in your career, there was a lot of uncertainty as to which way you should take, which road you should actually go, which would lead you to be eventually the William Kendridge of today. I mean, I think one can, one can always write one's biography in terms of the failures which have saved you. <laughs> Uh, even though at the time they are suffered as failures, they're not suffered as, oh, this is a lucky thing that I failed. Right. <laughs> so I tried to, I mean, as South African artist did in the 1970s when I was a student, I tried becoming an, an artist which was to say painting with oil paint on canvas. That's what a real artist did. And I was so bad at it that I was reduced to making drawings and then prints. Making prints became the safe excuse for not making paintings. What, what is the matter with oil paint for you and color? I think it was when I was doing a painting, the question I would ask myself as, I, as the painting emerged was, does this look good? And if you're an artist and that's a question you ask yourself, that's a terrible question. <laughs> you know, the picture has to take its chances on how it looks at the end. It's not about that. It's about a different kind of engagement. Whereas when I was drawing, it was about following a process of thinking or impulses, and it wasn't constantly stepping back saying, ah, oh, if only I'd made a better red, then that would sit better with the green. But the, it got lost in a dead formalism, even though there were figurative paintings. There was something about the color and the wetness of the paint that was, uh, it was just, I didn't have a feel for it. I mean, and I struggled for many years trying to be a painter. It wasn't tried it for an afternoon, it was several years in the salt mines of carefully mixing and trying to try different techniques. So that was a disaster. And then I thought at a certain point, uh, well, this whole art making obviously isn't for me. The phrase that went through my head constantly was, you do not have the right to be an artist, because an artist has to know what they're saying. And I didn't know what I was saying. So I thought, well, then I'll become an actor and went to theater school in Paris and failed very thoroughly at that. <laughs> I mean, clearly enough. No, no, it's good to have a thorough failure. If I'd been a sort of a marginal actor, not terrible, but sort of okay, then I could have had a miserable next 50 years of wondering why I always got the bad roles and never got the lead role in any production. So that was clear, I should not be an actor. After three weeks, it was clear. Why, why, <laughs> why would you go all the way to Paris to be an actor from Johannesburg? It's well, I'd... I'd worked in, when I was at university, I'd both been going to art lessons in the evening and also working with a student theater group in which I was both actor and designer and sometimes writer. And the pr way of working with theater in South Africa at the time was largely through workshop, through improvisation, through making a text with everybody working together. And in the Anglo-Saxon, in the English, particularly in Britain, and in the South African theater schools, the approach to theater was psychological and text-based. You would analyze a text, analyze characters, and work from there outwards. And I'd heard about the school in Paris, which was a school not of mind, but of movement, in which one worked not from a text, in which there was no text to be used in the air, but from improvisation and everything you can learn without a text about someone. And that was by far the best art training I ever had. And then so the third failure was I came back to South Africa saying, well, I can't be an artist, I can't be an actor, and tried to make films, and that was also a disaster. I mean, I had a job in the South African film industry carrying furniture, and I was really bad at carrying <laughs> furniture. And uh, discovered then that in spite of myself, I was back in the studio making drawings. And then thought, how can I, long can I survive if I make drawings? 
before I have to go back to carrying furniture in the film industry. <laughs> and fortunately, since then, I haven't had to go back to carrying furniture. So I was, I was, there, so I was reduced to being an artist. But you have become an artist who is also an actor because you appear in many of your own works. I think in the in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, when I when this is all happening, there was a clear sense of you needed to master your art. So people said, well, if you're going to make drawings, just do drawings. Don't mess around with theatre, which is also why I went to. And if you're going to be an actor, learn how to be an actor, but stop with the idea of doing drawings. And if you're going to be a filmmaker, learn films. And it took me a good 10 years afterwards to unlearn that lesson, mm -hmm. to understand the only hope for the drawings was if they were contaminated by things that happened in animation or in film. And the only hope for the film, if sometimes it got knocked off its pedestal by theatre that was happening around it. And to understand the migration of images and impulses from one medium into another, whether it's sculpture or tapestry or drawing or animation or theatre. And then I found I was back on the stage, but always only as the same character. So that was, that was kind of safe. <laughs> and that it's never acting. It's doing set actions, but it's never acting, which I'm still very, very bad at. But you're really good at doing William Kendridge. Well, I wouldn't say I'm good at doing William Kentridge, but there's this other person that <laughs> stands in and does this rather poor imitation of who he should be, and that's, <laughs> that's what gets into all the films. Um, but I think that you know, in doing that, what it obviously is about also is trying to track down the, the multiple selves that we all have. Mm. Um, so it's both a, a joke or a game putting myself against myself. But it's also understanding the sometimes antagonistic relationship we have to ourselves, not just in the field of art, but you know, in which the field of art is emblematic of how we have to go through the world. Where there's part of you that is busy doing and speaking, and there's another part of you that's sitting back and saying, my God, look how full of himself he seems, <laughs> going on and on and on and talking at them. Just be quiet. And the other one gets more and more animated, keeping talking further and further, and the second self gets further and further removed. Or you write something, you write a text, and while you're writing it, as you're writing it, it feels, everything feels great, every sentence feels great, and then you sit back and read it, and you think, well, my, is this, who is the idiot who wrote that? That's not me. <laughs> so that separation is, is often done in the films or in other things, but it's... Uh, It's both giving yourself to that activity, but also when it comes out of it, seeing if something can be demonstrated of the world outside of the activity itself. There's a lot, I mean, this, this happens in your studio, and, and I mean, your studio to me almost seems like a complete world in itself. You have talked a lot about your studio. Can you, can you give people here an idea about how your studio works. I know you have two. I have two, but it's, I mean, there could be one, it's just that different things happen in the different ones. I mean, the studio for me is a, is a vital physical space. It's not a conceptual space of a studio. It is about a physical walk. It's about the physical activity that happens in a studio. So, um, Obviously, like all artist studios, there's millions of images pinned up on the wall, both work that's in progress of my own, but photographs, postcards, newspaper cuttings, texts, all the stuff that one surrounds oneself with. And so the walk in the studio becomes very... It doesn't become important, but I realize at the start of every day there's very often this pacing around, the physical pacing, literally walking around the studio in which there's both a kind of peripheral vision of things you pick up at the side of your eyes as you're walking past, and allied to that a kind of peripheral thinking of ideas that connect from this image to that, taking something from one project and seeing it how it could come into another. So that's one sense of the physical studio. The other, which is a vital thing, is that it becomes a safe space for idiocy, for stupidity, for not knowing what you're doing, for allowing, 
giving the impulse the benefit of the doubt. Where you can put up a camera and act like an idiot in front of the camera as you are testing things out. Um, in which you don't have to justify something before it is done. So in that sense the space is not the same as a therapeutic or psychoanalytic space, but it has echoes of allowing free association, of saying don't question why an image emerges, but trust that there is something behind it which may come to make sense later on. So that's another and so then you can think of the studio itself as a kind of an enlarged head. If you think of your head, all the different impulses that come in every day, which you then sift through and from that make a sense both of the world and of ourselves. But instead of the thoughts traveling you know, three centimeters from one part of your brain to the other, it's this walk of eight or nine meters. So it's in that's one sense in which it, the studio is an expanded head. And also the way in which a studio then obviously is kind of emblematic of a gallery space also of the images. Um. So are you a different person when you open the door and close it behind you when you're in the studio? I mean, stupidity is, is not, I mean, I guess you can, it's not viable everywhere you have when you are moving around in the world. No, I mean, it's, it, it is, there are definite things that can happen there that can't happen. Um, that can't happen elsewhere. Um, and it's not, it's not hunting, it's, uh, let me put this way, it's not hunting for stupidity for stupidity's sake. No. But saying that in trying to track down the logic of either a thought or an image or a movement, and if you're filming very often it's trying to track the logic of a movement, to try to learn the grammar of something that's come to you. Uh, that there's a lot of testing and retesting and remaking um, and that's obviously something that you do in the studio, out of which comes finally a coherent piece of work which you can present to the, to the world. And that's maybe what happens in our head also, if you think of all the sentences we don't say. <laughs> Sometimes under extreme stress we are aware of pre preparing a sentence before it is said. What should I say to this person and you rehearse it? But generally we rely on some part of our brain to be doing all that practicing and learning and energy beforehand and the words and the sentence will come out roughly grammatically correct and going in a direction that we know of. But we can't predict each sentence as it goes. So maybe all of that internal testing out of should I say this or that and then finally coming out with one is also analogous to all the different tests and possibilities in the studio till the coherent sentence finally emerges. So is this, a, is this a solitary process for you? Because you work so much with other people. Um, I do work a lot with other people. Part of it is completely solitary. The drawing is all solitary. That doesn't help to have someone else in the room or doing it. Uh, a lot of the filming of myself is just me and the camera. But there's a lot of other work. A lot of work, I mean, as in the piece that's in the museum here, I've refused the hour, was a... As my wife said, it started off with there was much more team than there was project. <laughs> and it was. It's a bit like the film memo, gathering friends or people, not friends, colleagues, co-workers, people I like working with, and saying, well, what's the next thing we're going to do? So it both has to do with the energy gained from working with a lot of people, or particular people with particular skills, and as a secondary thing, saying, well, what is the sentence that emerges out of it? Uh, and then working very hard to learn the grammar of that sentence and to correct it and to uh, have the text that emerges or the image that emerges. Um, so I think collaboration, you know, it's a, vital, it's a very vital part of the, of the process. And it's not just working with skilled technicians. It's saying with the particular skills and possibilities each person offers, what is the way the project can expand to incorporate that or to, to use that? I have a small clip that I would like for you to see. I think you, you know it, but if we, it'll, I think it will come behind us, so maybe we can move to the side and see what happens.
Did you see the moth? That was not in the, in the film. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the genius pieces of comic filmmaking from, from them, which I've tried to copy in a couple of different times, a couple of different occasions. Um, that's 1933 when they make that. Um, so not just the rise of Hitler, but you've got Betty the Boop cartoons, which are also great cartoons. You've got uh, Trotsky in exile in Turkey at the time. But the, so it's got lots of strange things of what this doubling up of a person is, sets of associations that go, what is the nature, what is the place for comedy in situations of uh, international catastrophe, all of these um, strange things. But I'm kind of held by the study of learning the grammar of how to do that piece. How close do they have to be for it to work? They're, if they're perfect, then it stops working. If they're too far off, it also stops working. There has to be this elastic tension between a real mirror and clearly not a mirror that, that, goes, um, that goes on. So in the studio, we literally built a double room, sort of identical on each side, and had an actress uh, walking across on both sides and testing out. There they had the advantage that they had all the brothers, so in fact it's not one person filmed twice, it's the three Marx brothers all <laughs> themselves. So it's, it's Chico and Harper being the two, uh, two, Chico and Groucho being the two Grouchos. Um, whereas when we were doing it, it was one person filmed twice trying to remember what she'd done the time before. And the, the, so the idea in the studio is one thing, to say let's restage the scene. But the work that goes on and on is trying to find what is the nature of the, of the movement, what things are too close to the Marx Brothers, what's the element of it that needs to be, to be held on to. Um, and that's a very practical, that is a very practical physical testing, both a, a physical doing and then a physical looking at it to say does it work or does it not work rather than a conceptual judgment of it. But there's something amazing about the way he runs into this mirror that goes kapoo, because it's also about seeing. It is about seeing, but it's also about the skill of the Marx Brothers or Buster Keaton as physical performers. Uh, you can understand what he's doing and you try to do it yourself to run smash into a wall of a mirror <laughs> and fall down like that, and you've got to be a professional 1930s and 20s vaudeville performer to, have, to be able to do that. You love that period. Well, it's a, I mean, it's an astonishingly rich period, not just in the popular cultural stage, but in, the, um, in what was happening in Germany, in Russia. In, there's kind of a, a strand of modernism, you know, in my art historical education in South Africa, there was very much the conventional wisdom of modernism was the greats of French Impressionism and post-Impressionism turning to the Expressionists in Germany and then to Matisse and then at some point crossing the Atlantic to the United States where Jackson Pollock takes on the mantle and American color field painting becomes the apotheosis of Western culture. I mean, very much the Greenbergian view. And so it became very clear to me, wanting to work from the traditions and the radicalism of modernism, but needing to find a line that would not end up with the kind of abstraction or interest of American painters, which seemed so far from the world in South Africa of the struggle against apartheid and all those eras in the 70s and 80s that I look to strands of modernism, which for me very much were Russian and German as different directions of ways of thinking about keeping figuration, keeping a connection to social questions in the work itself. The refusal of time that we were just talking about when I threw in Groucho and, and the brothers is, is a work which is it's almost like a silent movie. It has a lot to do with that. I think the... Um, in the piece, which is about uh, time and theories about time, it was getting very heavy, and at a certain point in the workshop, we said, OK, we're going to give ourselves eight hours, and in this, we're going to make a silent movie from <laughs> 1905, the key date, the year of uh, 
Einstein's theory, special theory of relativity. So it'll be a 1905 silent movie, one film about the blowing up of the Greenwich Meridian. I mean, this was an extraordinary thing in, I think it was 1889, a French anarchist decided to blow up the Greenwich Meridian as a protest against globalizing science. And <coughs> he made the bomb, but his uh, clock was defective. And he blew himself up while walking up the hill to the Greenwich Observatory. So this is the actual story, but then Joseph Conrad takes the story and writes that into The Secret Agent, which is the story of someone going to blow up the Greenwich Observatory and blowing himself up instead. And then Joseph Conrad's story is the inspiration for the Unibomber, who's trying to blow up GPS satellites and tracking stations and the control of time in the 1980s and 90s. So this shift between myth, history, fiction coming back into the world was behind it. So it was, we gave ourselves eight hours to make a film, these films of the, so a couple of hours to paint each set and then an hour to film each each sequence, so it had a kind of improvised, not sure what quite what was going to happen um, in them, what was going to happen in each film. We knew there would be the sequence of, of films. Um, and I think there is, there's something important about the energy that is, there's something important about the possibilities that the energy itself generates. So it's not to say that that in itself becomes a great piece of filmmaking, it's not. It's, you know, it's a quick, slight uh, five frames of this telling of the story. Um, but there was something in that rush to make it, of people thinking on their feet as it was done, which propelled the next stage of the work for the composers, for the people making the objects. And I think that, that wave of energy that can go through the studio is an is an important thing, for my, for my work at any rate. And the uncertainty, the, the, uh, the notion of, we in this case have to forget the heavy theories on time and Einstein and all that, and then run into the mirror and do it. I hadn't thought of running into the mirror, but <laughs> yes, I think that's, that's right. Um, I mean, the extraordinary thing about uh, Science, obviously this is a, this, in terms of rigorous science, the piece that's on exhibition here is completely vague and unrigorous. But I was relieved to hear that a physicist say to me, but you understand that for mathematics, so artists seem very unrigorous to physicists. To every mathematician, the most rigorous f physicist is like a completely unrigorous poet. <laughs> they have these vague ideas, but the maths they use to bolster it is so speculative, so unrigorous, so un... Um, and so that was the one shock. The other was to understand that even at the most extreme points of thinking about physics, either about things tiny or things gigantic, the scientific theories always start off as a kind of metaphorical thinking. And they try as they can to avoid metaphoric thinking and to keep everything practical or directly connected to the world, it only works when there is a metaphoric leap or jump. So a description of string theory has to be in terms of the idea of vibrating strings and information kept on cradles and cat's cradles of strings spinning around. Um, it has to have some physical vi visible manifestation. I mean, all of Einstein's theories of trains and stations and trains going. It's also not just, it doesn't come out of nowhere, it comes out of him working on patterns for clocks in railway stations, <laughs> which is what was happening in Europe in, when he was working in the patent office in Bern, trying to stop all the trains crashing into each other uh, from the stations in Europe when they each had their own time. Um, so that shift between the practical and ideas that come out of the practical, um, is a kind of an important thing to keep track of in the, in the studio. The refusal of time is perhaps also a way. I, I, I know that you have a book that you like and you may even have drawn in it. Do you especially draw in books that you like? Fine old books that you like? 
I mean, drawing in old books, is, that's a whole separate question, but there is a lot of drawing in old books. But it has to do, again, with the mixture of what is the subject of the book, what are the sets of associations that come out of it, but mainly what is the quality of the paper. Mm -hmm. Some paper is, has no size in it, so the, it absorbs ink like blotting paper, but is very good for charcoal drawing because it's got a good tooth. Other paper has just the right amount of size and that holds a pool of ink and allows it to distill out into different darknesses. Generally, encyclopedias sort of pre-1830 are really great. Um, and some books around the turn of the century are also, the paper is very beautiful. But the book I was yes. wanting you to tell about has also to do with the time, uh, Machado de Assis and his book, um, the Epitaph, Epitaph of a Small yeah. Winner. Epitaph of a Small Winner. This is a Brazilian... A, Bra uh, a fantastic Brazilian, one of the great Brazilian authors, Machado de Assis. <laughs> and uh, I think in Portuguese it's Memorias Postumas do Bras Cubas. It is. Is the novel. And it's, it's, it's a, a novel written for, by the dead about their life. But it has a kind of playfulness with the form of writing. With one chapter that just consists of question marks or dashes and dots and one chapter that will be one sentence long, um, that had an, an openness to thinking about form that for me was a revelation. And so thinking about form in a novel then opens the thinking about, well, what is the form of a film? Does it have to have the traditional narrative one associates with, with conventional animated films or other films? And say, no, you can work in a very much more open way. So in that sense, it's a, I love the book because of its demonstration of possibilities. It's it's a book. It's it's a biography of a dead man. It's a biography. A man who's dead writes from the grave about his trying to balance his life. Was he a? Did he win or lose? And he decides he comes out slightly a small winner, <laughs> slightly. But I mean, even that is kind of a refusal of time, isn't it? To be writing from the grave. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, the refusal of time is a joke. I mean, it's the one thing we can't do, but we can act as if we could. And so in the studio, uh, it's bored to go back to the studio, but there are practical physical ways we can demonstrate it, like in running a film backwards rather than forwards, as if one could run time backwards, as if you could call something back. Uh, you could call the dropped vase, you could call back from the ground into your hand, uh, you know, which then brings in questions of can we go against entropy? Can the world be undone? Can we, is it all getting worse or can we rescue things from it? Um, Some of the stupidities we shouldn't have said. All the things that we wish, you know, when you hit send on the email and you say, oh my God, that's exactly <laughs> the wrong person and you can't call it back, it's gone. <laughs> the sentence you said and afterwards you realize, oh my God, why did I say that? Just look on that person's face as I said it. How do I pull that back? So all of those regrets. So when you think about running time backwards, it's usually about regret. Um, and so the utopian vision of of things going backwards, of running time backwards, is about the perfectibility of all the things you wish we could undo and unsay and unremember, all of those, those parts, which you can kind of demonstrate in, to some extent in music, slowing it down, playing music backwards, talking backwards, um, and filming backwards. Can you talk backwards? I can't talk backwards, but... Uh, I mean, it's... You have to, so like, them I taught on staff. That's not what I meant. Loto do I taught on staff. That's not what I meant at all. So that way kind of going. But walking backwards is an interesting, I mean, if you, if you want to film, if you want to film, you want to film a scene backwards so that in the end the shattered vase can somehow be magically put together, then in a way you have to, if you're going to, if the vase is in your hand, you have to be walking backwards and then projecting it forward. So it looks like you film it walking backwards, so when you project it, it looks like you're walking forwards. But now if you simply, if you simply uh, walk backwards without thinking about it and you walk backwards, that's easy enough to film. But then when you project it forwards, it's a very awkward walk, because then you're walking like, <laughs> like that. So you have to find the grammar of a very awkward backwards walk. So you've got to walk backwards in a very awkward way 
so that when you project it forward, it's a kind of an easy <laughs> walk forward. So that's what I mean about the learning the grammar of it, is saying, okay, we know the idea, the principle. And then if you're catching something out of the air, do you throw it and then pause and then put your hand down so that when you reverse it, you're up and waiting for it and there it comes? Or do you throw it and put your hand down so that almost without thinking your hand has caught it? And <laughs> brought. So these are the, I mean, th this is the, it's two days of standing in the studio throwing encyclopedias <laughs> to see what they look like when they come back into your, into your hand as there's some of the sequences there. Oh. So that's the... So there's both the learning of the grammar and then there's also what does it suggest when the action is finished. So for example with all the reverse filming it suggests a kind of uh, utopian perfection of things that can be perfected. So if you tear something up, when you run it backwards there's a kind of a completely invisible perfect mend and repairing of, of whatever's been destroyed. You take a pot of paint and throw it on the wall and when you run it backwards, you not only clean the wall completely, but you catch every single drop in it. <laughs> I mean, there's a kind of... And so when you watch it, there's a kind of, you know what it is, but you still feel the pleasure of this extraordinary skill, as if it was your own skill. You kind of take credit for it, even though it's not your own. Um, and so that tells you something about what is that desire to, for the world to be that way that it can never be. You're a magician. Well, a magician in the same way that all magicians have many, many different techniques and tricks, and their skill is in learning those rather than doing it. But talk, I mean, talking of magicians, there was one very instructive moment, many, many, maybe 30, 40 years ago, which was in Paris seeing a tiny circus, which was called La Cirque Imaginaire, which had two performers in it and one trained goose, badly trained goose. But there was one sequence in it in which a man was blowing bubbles and he would blow the bubbles and then he took a hammer and as he hit each bubble it turned to glass. At, I don't know how, but it turned to glass. You could hear them, they shattered, they were glass bubbles. So I don't know how they went from soap to glass, but that was clear. And then he showed that in fact that as he, he did it again and then he lifted his waistcoat and you could see on his hand here he had a little bell <laughs> and as he hit each bubble with the hammer, he hit the bell. And the sound of the tinkling of the bell completely convinced you they were made of glass. So then the interesting thing was you saw how it was done. You knew it was a trick. You knew there was soap, and he was hitting soap with a hammer and ringing a bell. But you still couldn't stop believing they were made of glass. So it was about, that was about a kind of... A, a pleasure of self-deception, even though you knew you were being deceived, it didn't stop it from working, and there was a new pleasure from understanding it and viewing yourself enjoying it. And I think that, that element of what it is to see how something is done and participate in your own viewing of it is a vital... I think that's what we all do when we look at a painting. You kind of, you look at a Velazquez painting and you do two things. You say, God, that silk is, or that lace collar is astonishing. And as you go close, you see, in fact, it's just quite rough flecks of white paint that have been put on the canvas quite roughly. And you can see that and you step back and it's this extraordinary lace. <laughs> and so it's that pleasure of saying, I know this is only just rough brush marks. That's why those rough painterly things are so much stronger for us than where it's completely seamless and you can't see the brush mark at all, that we like seeing the, the way it is made because we have that double pleasure of understanding the craft and the, the artistry in the making and our participation in the construction of the illusion. Um, and that's obviously what we do. I mean, it, again, it's something that we all do all the time is we have to construct a coherent whole, or image of a coherent whole, from incoherent fragments. So you half hear a sentence, and you immediately fill in the rest of the sentence as if you'd heard it. Um, we kind of have a need to make sense of images or sounds as we get them, and painting is one way where we're very conscious of looking at something very artificial, but being unable to stop ourselves also seeing the reference 
in the world that it is. Can I ask you a strange question? Is, of is, 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 there, is there a connection between a courtroom and a theatre stage, or your studio even? A courtroom you're asking because my father is a lawyer. Yes. Um, I don't know that there's much relationship between the courtroom and the studio. There's a strong relationship between the courtroom and the uh, stage. Because what an advocate has to do is convince the court or the judge, or if there's a jury, a jury, but in South Africa, a judge of the rightness of their arguments, and that's always a performance, because on the one hand it is the logic of the ideas, but there's also the, all the rhetorical things which aren't verbal, which we use to convince people about what we say. I mean, the, the gestures, the, the pauses, all those non-verbal pieces of convincing that we use whenever we talk in court or on stage. But I think there's a way in which, obviously, with the legal profession, it's about rational argument, and the studio is about evading rational argument. Can you arrive at a meaning that doesn't have to go through the process of rational argument, that in a way is uh, safe from cross-examination? Um, so was your father happy when you wanted to be an actor? I think he was worried when I wanted to be an actor, because I think he had a better sense than I had of <laughs> my abilities there. Um, he was not so, he was always supportive of me being an artist, both my parents were. Um, but he was always skeptical also. So it, his view would be, I'm not saying it's impossible to do a production of Wozzeck using puppets, <laughs> I'm just wondering why it's necessary. <laughs> Which is a hard question, and so the, end, the only answer is I'm doing it because it's not necessary. It's surplus. It's what you gain when it's not in the realm of essential activities. Um, so I think there was. There is a connection between a legal father and an artist son, I'm sure. There must be. I mean, I think one has to understand that one does not spend... 40 years being an artist without there being some psychic insufficiency. I mean, artists are always incomplete. If you're a complete person, there's no need to spend your life making other objects for people to look at. You should be sufficient in yourself. So there's some lack in yourself that you say, look at this thing that I've done, and in your looking at that, I will look at you and know that I am here, or something like that. But there has to be some... Otherwise, to leave so many pieces of paper, so many traces behind oneself is insane. In, in the air. In the air, or in the studio, or on the walls. It's or the museums. Or the museums. Um, there's an uncertainty of existence, I'm sure. I'm sure. But also there is a, a part of his life and your upbringing which is in your work because it's not a political body of work, yet there's a lot of political life going on in the... Well, I mean, all the work is made in Johannesburg, in South Africa, which certainly till I was 40 was the period under apartheid, so all my growing up and the first period of being an artist. And this last 20 years has been in the period since the first democratic election, which is not a period, I would say, immune from apartheid, but in which so many of the problems of South Africa continue or change and find new forms. So that a sense of a society in transition and in a difficult transition is very much part of the material that is in the studio and around the studio. So it would be very difficult to imagine working there all these years and it not to be part of the way of working or thinking. But I also understood early on for myself that trying to deal with it head on to say, here is the question, how does one analyze it? What images need to be made? A kind of a Leninist view of art making just didn't work for me. It had to be in a much more oblique and deflected way. <laughs>